Hello, and welcome back to the Guns on Pegs podcast. Uh, Chris is here as usual. How are you doing, Chris? I'm good, George. I'm good. I'm in one piece. Yeah? How you? You fe- yeah, not too bad. You were feeling a bit crappy. Yeah, it's the world. I don't know. You know, I think we've been wearing face masks for too long. My immune system is now just catching everything it wanted to catch over the last two years. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm all good, though. I'm all good. good. I've got, I've got an ish- uh, something that just happened just before we came on air. I just want to run by you. Have you ever known a dog? to like run to the door when it needs to go out to go to the loo take one like whiff of the air outside and then leg it back to their bed and like i'm never going out there <laughs> have you seen that no is it hosing it down with rain i mean my my mum's my dachshunds will look at the weather and then go nah no 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 she, she she catches something on her nose in the air and then will just not go outside for the next two or three hours you will not get her outside. Is that the first time it's happened or it happens a lot? No, she's she started doing it more and more recently and I don't know what's causing it, but it's quite weird. And the other day we're out on a walk and suddenly she caught the smell and then just froze. I had to pick her up and carry her home. Weird. I know. So anyway, working dog, she's not really going to be a very good one, is she? <laughs> <laughs> well, she might be. I mean, it sounds to me like there's some smell, like a badger or a fox or something that just puts the wind up her a bit. It's hard, um, isn't it? Yeah. But weirdly, today is a different direction of wind to the day uh, to when it normally happens. So I thought oh, it must be coming from a farm nearby or something. But um, anyway, we'll ask our guest in a minute. He might have something bad. He may not. <laughs> well, yeah. Go on then. Um, why don't you tell us who we have with us today? Yeah, absolutely. So our our guest today is um, well, as far as we can tell, basically permanently shooting or fishing or stalking or not really in the UK, just having a laugh. And and it's sort of one of these eternal questions knocking around from people that shoot, be like, what's he do for a living? What, you know, how does he do all this stuff? Uh, so that's going to obviously be on, on the tips of our tongues today. But he's a, he's a PR and brand consultant by trade. Uh, so that gives us some clue. Um, but he's got 10,000 people that follow his escapades on Instagram. Um, he works with Parazzi. He also has worked with Edgar Brothers and Basque and many more. Uh, and you'll rarely see him without a cigar in his mouth. And he, but he's a really fun and upbeat guy and a great guest for this pod. So a huge warm welcome to Nathan Little. Thanks very much for having me, gents. Um, great to uh, great to get to join you both. And um, I'm a big fan of this. So uh, when you when I got the call, I jumped at it. So ah, uh... <laughs> uh, flatterer. So come on, let's ans- answer the question. Chris described you as a PR and brand consultant, but what is it that you? How would you describe what you do and how that relates to your ability to jet set around the place doing fun things? Let's just call it international man of mystery and leave it at that, and then we'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll move on. Um, no, it's 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 one of those things. I, I've I've been involved in shooting as 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 many of us have for for quite some time now. I mean, I started my first little venture into the industry, at age sixteen, with um, my Laird sporting directory and subsequent infamous parties at the game affair, uh, which went on for a few years. You know, we get we go away, we try different things, and you know, we go. I went uh, went down the educational route. And my my actual background now is, is is politics, and then I came back to the industry with Monty Social, which is my PR and brand uh, branding agency, having worked in a few different uh, organisations, as you say, Chris, look, with Basque and Edgar Brothers, and advising um, uh, companies on brand image and PR and how the public perception. And I think I do that. I think my skill set for that is because I don't come from a shooting background. I come from a totally working class, non-shooting family who just happened to find myself miraculously in shooting. And um, consequently, it's become fiercely addictive. And it's it's now how I make my living advising businesses. Sounds like Rishi Sunak's wife could do with a bit of your help right now. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for the call. The, call, the phone's on the, on, the, on, the, on the side at the moment. So I turn my sort of political experience from coming from a, a non-shooting background to advising businesses on you know just treading the line of what's what's tasteful what's appropriate and and how to navigate potential pitfalls and consequently I just end up shooting a hell of a lot because I love it I find my, <laughs> my addiction now is salmon fishing and I haven't had a fish for two years and everybody is absolutely ribbing me online going you know you're you know you may as well give up give up on it don't listen to them no. I mean, I know some very experienced and very skillful salmon fishers who've gone way longer than two years without a fish. Um, but it's that it's that working for it that makes it makes it so good. I've got friends who are 
serious fish, uh, fishermen. And then and I said to them, I said, well, I've got three days on the altar this year. And they were all like, how the hell have you got on there? How, how did you, though? I won the I won the little um, lottery thing. Oh, really? 50 quid and I won three days. <laughs> they were like, you damn sod. <laughs> Good work. Brilliant. <laughs> right, so let's crack on. Nathan, why don't you tell us what's that you're drinking? Well... I've gone for something slightly different. I've gone for um, so a company that I that I, I know and have had a bit of a chat with are called um, Heroes and Heretics. They're a L- London, a city-based um, brand, and they've done this whiskey roller hard seltzer, and it comes in a can, and it's for people that don't particularly like you know the harshness of a whiskey. I think, and they sent me some up, and to be honest, this is the first time I've tried it. It's actually really, really nice. So describe it to us. What, uh, what, what's it? What was it most similar to then? You do get the um, the whiskey tone to it, the whiskiness, but it's not that harshness on the back of your throat that some of them have, some some whiskies have. I think what well, that that's the thing that puts people off, isn't it? If you have a whiskey, it's that hit on the back of your throat because obviously it's you know they're not doing you know they're not drinking it properly or it's. I mean, I'm not a whiskey buff, but it's just nice. It's quite refreshing actually. Um, what is it percentage wise? It's only four <laughs> percent. <laughs> so I've heard the term hard seltzer and I haven't the faintest idea what it means. Does it just mean severely watered down? I think that's what it is. So, it's, so is it just water? No, it's, it, it's, let's have a look. Um, is, is it still? Is it, well, no, it's, it's, it's fizzy. It's, um, it says this whiskey roller is, is a refreshing, uh, refreshing whiskey based hard seltzer made for, for people who don't like drinking whiskey. Go figure. That's the actual. I oh, really. <laughs> I, I used to serve I used to serve people slow whiskey who didn't like whiskey. It's a cracking way to get you on it. <laughs> I used to, I'll have to try. I'll have to try that way. Um, but this is this is remarkably nice. So for people that don't like whiskey, try that. Very good. Very it's, good. Those, that's that stuff out of a can is it's always deceptive because you know when you buy like a if you're getting on a train and you buy a gin and tonic from a can from like M and S, and it says on the thing oh it's like five percent or something. You drink it and you're like my god this is like it's like a quadruple. And it's only 5%. I've never quite caught my head around that. So the stuff we're obviously pouring at home is obviously very weak. It's the lack of, it's the lack of a slice of lemon or lime in it. That's why that's it tastes it so boozy. Yeah, for sure. Chris, what have you got? So for the second time in the history of the pod, I've copped out from something adventurous. Uh, and I have a cup of Twining's Earl Grey uh, <laughs> because I'm really not feeling that great. Uh, but it's in my Claire Brownlow pheasant feather mug look. Uh, which is uh, which uh, is lovely. well. I, I suppose we'll let you off. I've I've managed to somehow link it, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's tenuous at best, but we'll let you get away. <laughs> I was going to go for an even more exotic Earl Grey, but I I do have one. I don't really like it. I've gone back to the Twinings. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Earl Grey, Earl Grey tastes like dishwater, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, uh, Yorkshire tea all the way. Here, here. I'm, in the morning, fine, but I'm a big Earl Grey afternoon person. So anyway, <laughs> George, how about you? Well, I mean, no surprises, I've got a whiskey, but after the last recording, I felt that maybe there was a bit of judgment from certain quarters that I had the same drink twice in a row. So I went to the, to the shop and bought the most exotic sounding one. Well, not, I mean, not going mad, it's still from Scotland. Um, <laughs> so I've got a Balveni, uh, and it's Caribbean cask, 14 years, aged in rum casks, and it is really very nice. It's, you know, compared to... To a lot of whiskies, it's really not harsh at all. That's like some of that harshness that Nathan was talking about, isn't there? It's got sort of sweet vanilla stuff going on. Um, really smooth, really nice, um, quite powerful. Um, but uh, just in case anybody was feeling that I'd stop trying, um, I haven't. But if anybody has got any recommendations for things that I should check out whiskey wise, very open to suggestions. And if anybody wants to send me one, <laughs> might send you might send you some garters. <laughs> oh dear, here we go. I think, I think that's definitely illegal, isn't it? Well, I should say, I mean, before we get onto the listener correspondence proper, do you remember a few episodes ago um we had an unpopular opinion about homemade slow gin? Yeah. Um somebody who was clearly in, as incensed as we were at the, the suggestion that homemade slow gin is no good suggested that he might send us a bottle of his homemade slow gin in exchange for some garters. So we'll have to think about whether... I think the sort of exchange rate for a set of garters is a bit more than that. I think so, you've got a... like a case? Well, it, yeah, that or a, a really good story that obviously makes it on, you know? Yeah. It's, it's... 
We'll see. We'll taste it. And then we maybe be the judge after that. <laughs> <laughs> Say Either Richard. way, though, I think you need to be having I think you need to be having whiskies from far flung places other than just Scotland. I think you be trying some strange stuff. OK, uh, I'm keen for you to be doing that. There's some nice Japanese ones, I'm told. So maybe that'll be my next port of call. I think local home brews from all over different parts of the world are, are quite <laughs> interesting to, to do as well. Yes. I, mean, I remember having um, schnapps that came in a, a plastic water bottle, a little like water bottle. And we'd, we, I'd been hunting uh, mouflon and we'd, we'd, we'd been successful. So they all wanted to party. And I thought I was going to end up blind by the end of it. That's how strong <laughs> it was. I've had experiences like that in Europe as well. Um, yeah, local moonshine is always to be approached with care, in my experience. Right, George, whose bird is it anyway? Yeah, so uh, this one comes all the way from Florida. We've had a bit of a flurry of US correspondence in recent weeks, which is nice. Um, this is coming from somebody who I am going to call Javier, and uh, he has written, Greetings, George and Chris. Here in Florida, I shoot slash hunt with a very close-knit group of friends, and our time in the field is underpinned by two core elements, an elaborate and strictly enforced set of rules and a very formal, very thirsty end-of-season dinner and finds night. This will become relevant shortly. Earlier this season, one of the guys brought his cousin along for a day of walked-up snipe shooting. The cousin was very new to the sport and teetering on haplessness. He and I ended up next to each other on the same end of the line. Early into the walk, we flushed a bird that I shot cleanly with my first barrel. My brief moment of satisfaction was interrupted by two blasts from the cousin who took both shots at the falling bird and loudly announced, got it. (laughs) I didn't think much of it and gently advised him that shooting at already dispatched birds was poor form and left it at that. We retrieved the bird and carried on. A little later, we got into a thicker bit of cover and started flushing piles of birds. Over the course of a half hour, I had three great flushes and managed to shoot two. As before, the cousin took follow-on shots and claimed both. Very embarrassingly, and unlike the first bird, the thicker cover made made retrieval difficult and both birds were lost. It's important to note that these were not a two guns simultaneously shooting at the same bird situation. His shots were always at a very clearly dispatched and lifeless falling bird and well after my initial shots. At the post-shoot roundup, the cousin boasted extensively at having shot and lost two snipe on his first day out, adding the requisite, not sure what all the fuss is about, these birds are easy. Not wanting to sound petty or pedantic, I said nothing and let him take the credit. And herein lies the dilemma. <laughs> Our group's rules rely heavily on gentlemanli- gentlemanliness and honesty. Quite difficult to say that. Um, the forfeits for lost birds are fairly severe, but honesty, uh, dishonesty is considered a capital offence and carries a horrid and ungodly punishment. All the season's transgressions are adjudicated at the end of season dinner, which takes place in a month's time. Do I A, confess to having shot and lost the two snipe and accept my due, or B, let the cousin take credit for the lost birds and be punished accordingly, knowing that because I'm actually at fault and should that somehow come up, I will surely face charges of dishonesty. From a moral standpoint, I'm absolutely at ease with letting the cousin suffer his sin of hubris. I'd be tremendously grateful for your sage counsel on the above dilemma. Now, I don't know we can promise sage counsel, (laughs) <laughs> but we can we can offer counsel, I think. It's it's almost taken a twist at the end there. I kind of wasn't expecting because he's now in a predicament really for having having this guy just being a total idiot. Does he get, so he gets fined if he what remind me again of the circumstances in which he gets fined. Well, I think he gets fined in both circumstances. He gets fined if he says that he shot them and lost them, because lost birds are fined. But he also gets fined if he didn't own up to it in the first instance for dishonesty. Well, you see, I'd, I'd, I'd admit to shooting them and, and not, not finding them. It certainly feels like the lesser of two evils, doesn't it? Yeah, because also then it, it sort of draws the, um, the other chap into um, a situation where, where he's going to have to claim, he's, he's claiming that he shot them, but actually somebody else has claimed that they've shot them but admitted to losing them. So it's also, it's automatically going to draw him into a 
a, a fit of um, of um, dishonesty. So he's going to get found out. So that's that's the tr- that would be the trick to do it. It's, it. And the and the thing is, it's not just as simple as admitting to shooting them because the other bloke firmly thinks that he did. <laughs> so admit, and you're just going to have like some sort of awkward conversation. That's the more fun opportunity, right? Absolutely. That's the bit I was hoping he was going to go down because. <laughs> How long is this guy going to get away with this? That That's the bit I really want to focus on. I mean, the only unknown factor here is, I mean, he says that uh, forfeits for lost birds are fairly severe. I can understand that. But that dishonesty carries a, quote, horrid and ungodly punishment. <laughs> well, well, we've got to be going down that route then, don't we? And he's just I mean, got he to... to drink a proper alcoholic beverage as opposed to a Bud Light. <laughs> <laughs> Might well be that. I don't know. I... I'd buy. I'd. I'd just pay all the. I'd pay all the fines just to ensure that everyone had a, a, a proper party that night. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've we've got to make sure that somehow in the in the in the in the best ca- best way possible, this guy gets found out for the story that he's explained to us here. You know, loosing off a couple of barrels at an already dead bird. I mean, that's far worse because if he did hit it. And I'm going to assume that if he's constantly doing that, he's not a very good shot, so he probably missed it, right? But if he did hit it, then that bird, if you do pick it, then it's not particularly tasty, especially if it's a snipe. I was going to say, a thrice-shot snipe probably hasn't got a lot left, has it? (laughs) It is worth more weighed in. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's the biggest sin here. So we've got to pull this guy up on it. And if this guy, let's say he was just in the wrong situation, you know, wrong place, wrong time, and someone else has essentially created a fine for him, uh, then he's just got to take the smaller fine so that this guy gets the bigger fine. And and on Nathan's point, it's all in aid of having a good fun evening, right? So who yeah. cares? So do you? So would you be like standing up at the at the end of season dinner and, and saying, reading that out? <laughs> <laughs> I'd write a full speech directed at him, <laughs> or just playing this bit. <laughs> Gentlemen, you'll be pleased to know that our small syndicate has featured on the highly regarded Guns on Pegs podcast in the UK play and 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 then at this point they're listening in the dinner going right what's going to happen next and we're going to say right the chap now who was loosing off the shots could he please stand up we'll give him a second while he stands up right grab that nearest drink in front of you so apologize to everyone da- ne- around you now neck it <laughs> and then everyone pelts him with bread rolls yeah yeah exactly yeah now throw the nearest bread roll at him <laughs> <laughs> and don't do it again excellent well that actually might have been good advice <laughs> we want to know what the what the outcome was though yeah and and another financial fine for charity as well just just drinking is not acceptable financial fine for charity i think you can't beat a financial fine for charity it's uh the best way, best way to end the day yeah they're almost impossible to ignore aren't they yeah sort of sense of guilt right so chris have we got an unpopular opinion this week we do um um, this one comes from someone that George has called Fidel. Uh, I don't get to name these people, Nathan. Um, so Fidel's unpopular opinion, and this is unpopular, I think. I'm looking forward to this debate. He says, cartridge belts have no place in driven shooting. He says, while I appreciate the utility of these shooting accessories, understanding that they may provide the gun with quick access to shells, I believe they're unseemly and unnecessary on the driven day. I accept they would probably be a useful bit of kit when the wax jacket was a gun's best ki- best bet to keep comparatively warm and dry on a day. However, these days, with the excellent range of shooting attire in the market, often with voluminous pockets, the sportsman should have no need of bandoliers to quickly reload his shotgun. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I'm sure that the cartridge belt does have its place in shooting. But for now, I'd like to respectfully ask that the handful of fellow shooters who still wear these ugly accoutrements on driven days to put them away in a safe place. And then the next time one receives an invite to perhaps go fox shooting or maybe take part in a Central American coup, they can be bought out, dusted down and no doubt put to good use. (laughs) Well articulated. I hope I did a good job reading it. Um, Very good. Um. Go right, Nathan. Cartridge belts. Well, see, when you started off, I thought, well, he's he, he's nothing more than a, a, a field sports snob, which I love. You know, I, I love the odd field sports snob; they're brilliant. But then, as you went on, and you know, you continued on with with his um, with, with his point, I actually I actually thought, do you know what? Actually, he's maybe may right. You know, the, the bandolier was quite a, was 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 quite an interesting point, but they they can be unsightly. Um, but I think 
I, yeah, I think the great for fox shooting on a fox, on a fox track, <laughs> yeah, that, that I agree with. Um, but what are the what are the alternatives? I mean, you've got you know big pockets where your cartridges are just thrown in and they come in upside down, back to front, this way, that way, you know, and it's it's not necessarily the most efficient. Your cartridges are going to come out in the in the correct up, correct direction, really, for going into, into the into the gun. Um, and I suppose on on a smaller driven day, which I think more and more people are opting for these days, it's a quite it's a it's a little thing. It, you know, it's a nice, it's com- convenient, um, easy way of getting cartridges. So they do have their place. They aren't the most sightly thing. Depends who you, who's who's making them, or if it's a, a fancy leather one, but. I don't like those um, nylon ones. They're they're unsightly. Okay, so Nathan's basically firmly sitting on the fence. I've got to say, I feel personally attacked because (laughs) I don't use a cartridge belt, but I do use something that's much more akin to a bandolier. I've got my monkey loader, which does sit (laughs) across my shoulder uh, like a bandolier would, but it does prevent what Nathan was talking about, which is the upside-down cartridge problem. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to come down on the side of cartridge belts are okay. As long as they're, you know, tasteful, nice leather ones, not nasty plasticky ones. Um, I think of that day we had in Herefordshire, Chris, when, um, who was it? There was somebody shooting with us who had, uh, a shooting suit with a bit of orange in it, uh, in the check. And then was also using what I think must be the Ely uh grand prix traditional um steel cartridges which have got an orange case oh yeah matching your cartridges in your cartridge belt to your tweeds is that's <laughs> the true definition of style <laughs> um yeah i don't know i you see uh, car- cartridges you definitely don't see them as much do you like f- for the for the reasons this guy's pointing out you know like pockets are just they're just you know this kit's made a bit better however i've got something I want to put him up on. If he still wears long socks and garters, then his whole argument that shooting kit has developed and therefore shouldn't wear a cartridge belt is totally null and void because you can't let aspects of the kit develop and not other aspects and then sort of say, oh, we're going to hold on to that, but not that. You know, that's just not an argument. You either hold on to the whole lot. <laughs> I disagree entirely because he's saying that the, uh, sh- the cartridge belt is, is um, obsolete but I don't think there's a better solution uh, for you know being warm and comfortable and dry on a day's shooting than long socks and breeks. And plus, when you go into the supermarket after a shoot day in socks and garters, that's the best way of getting attention. <laughs> Is that yeah. what you want? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I quite like a cartridge belt. It reminds me of years ago. I don't know. I think, I think that's because there's pictures of like my dad around the house or something with like cartridge belts on from when he was younger. But, but. I th- but more importantly, though, they're pretty crap to load from. Like this, they're, they're quite tight. You can't exactly get cartridges out that quickly. I do think you've got to be quite careful. I've often wondered how the larger gentleman uses a cartridge <laughs> belt when you can't even see what it is that you're trying to extract. <laughs> <laughs> you've got the gun that wears a tie at the same time, and if he's quite on the portly side, he comes out looking like sausages. <laughs> <laughs> My great aunt's got a, a great phrase for, for those slightly larger gentlemen. She calls them members of the Dicky Doo Club because <laughs> his tummy sticks out further than his Dicky Doo. <laughs> uh, therefore, if you're that size, a cartridge belt is not a good look. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're probably better off wearing it over one shoulder and round the other arm. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> like you're like you're going to war. Double yeah. them over. <laughs> okay, so are we are we three nil in favour of cartridge belts? I yeah, I don't want to see the end of them. I just do think they're a bit crap, but I don't want to see the end of them. Yeah, they have a place, but not my cup of tea. So it's unpopular, yeah. that's for sure. His opinion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So finally we're gonna pick up our shooting hero segment, which we had a brief pause on last time. Uh Chris, who's been nominated this time? So Oliver Noble has written in and he's nominated this episode's Shooting Hero. Uh, And like with all of these, I'm sure his story will um, will sound familiar to many people listening because Oliver says, I'd like to give a huge shout out to a neighbour who I now class as a good mate. Josh dragged me out for a first day's beating on a local shoot and took me under his wing throughout. I was reluctant to begin with, but to say I'm now hooked is an understatement. 
Josh has now ushered me into shooting and helped me out on Beatus Day and since taken me out on numerous pigeon days to help me practice and become a better shot, build my confidence and ready for next season. Not only has Josh introduced me to a new hobby, he has introduced me to a new set of mates with whom we all share a common love for the great outdoors. That's what this is all about, isn't it? Josh definitely deserves a set of garters. Yeah, shoe in. <laughs> um, Nathan, you said at the very beginning that you didn't come from a shooting family and that kind of thing. Who was it who introduced you to shooting? How did it come about? Yeah, so none of my family shot. My dad got into it a little bit later on, or quite later on in life. And he went, he, but he'd go rough shooting and things like that on, on the odd occasion. And it was, he would, he would take me on the, on the odd occasion, but he did nothing of the sort of driven shooting, wild fouling, any, anything remotely like that. But he did like the idea of going out with his, very much the, the case of, um, of Josh is somebody introduced my dad to it very late on in life. He got into it and I just happened to be of an age where I could go and go and watch, but it wasn't. It never really stemmed from anything. A long line of, of shooting. So, and it was and it was very alien to the world that I'm from. City life, school, nobody shoots. So it's it's absolutely imperative that we have people like Josh out there and and all of us to take it upon ourselves to introduce somebody who doesn't shoot because it's such a benefit. We we almost need a challenge every year to like be more like Josh. <laughs> Everyone needs to do that once a year at least to someone you just wouldn't expect it, just to see what happens. I was literally going to say exactly the same thing. In fact, let's set the challenge and say to everyone listening, make the commitment now to take a non-shooting friend with you on a on a syndicate day or out into pigeon hide or something like that, and then send us the story. We'll read it out. I think so. The idea that getting him out beating first time is obviously just such a great way of doing it. Um, but that, even that, or a sim day actually, rather than just to the clay ground, which like loads of people get in touch, like get to go clay shooting on a clay ground because of like stag do's and things like that. But it's not quite linked enough. So a sim day is, is a bit closer. I'd like that. But I think if you can get them out beating, or as you said, like get them out on an actual game day, even if they're just standing with you, just to experience it and understand it, it's a massive step in the right direction, isn't it? It is because also I think I think also from the we harp on that it's a social sport, and that's that's the that's the key of it. Ninety percent of what we do is social. You know the you know the inevitability of of game shooting and and the actual, the actual shooting side is only a small fraction of what constitutes a, a day in the field. And I think you're absolutely right. Where if we can get somebody in who hasn't shot before, and take them even to experience a sim day, so they can see remotely what the what the enjoyment is and what it's all about, is is a perfect way of doing it. Good. So Josh gets a pair of garters, and rightly so. And obviously Oliver gets a set. You know, he's he's new into shooting. This will be his first year, and he's already going to be stepping out with a set of garters on. Yeah, so everybody, so Javier, Fidel, Oliver, Josh, Nathan, this is going to be, this is a garter heavy episode, five sets of garters handed out. I better order some more. <laughs> <laughs> They're all uh, members of the most noble order of the garters and will shortly be in receipt of a set of the very exclusive Guns on Pegs podcast shooting sock garters. If you would like a set of the most desirable garters in shooting, send us your confessions, quandaries or queries or unpopular opinions or shooting heroes or send me some whiskey. Uh, <laughs> drop us an email to pod at gunsonpegs.com. And if we use what you submit, you will uh, become a member of the most noble order of the garters. Right. So, Nathan, I think I saw you post that you've got something like, is it 12 trips booked over the next year and a bit? Yes. Yeah. Okay, quickly. Can you remember what they all are? Some of them are returning to the same country. So, but at the moment, we are salmon fishing in Norway. Norway again. So, Norway, Norway. I go back. Come back for for Scotland on the stags. Then I go to Kyrgyzstan for the ibex in October. Uh, I'll go to Norway again because I'm moose hunting. I go to Germany for the boar. Then we get to. Mongolia, Greenland, New Zealand, and I can't remember the other. I think it'll be back in back in Norway. So it's about eleven trips. Amazing. So uh, Mongolia is that fishing, Timon? No, I got a, uh, I got a phone call off. Um, uh, it's Matt Hollington, um, one of these sporting agents, and he said because he knows how addicted I've got to suddenly these these trips, and uh, he said, "Well, what what about um, hunting foxes and wolves with golden eagles?" So I said. 
put me in. So, <laughs> holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> I'm going to have to um, dust off my riding chaps um, because I haven't ridden in years. Um, and we're apparently off up, up, up mountains for eight days and we're spending time in a yurt um, drinking fermented uh, goat's milk, which is alcoholic apparently. And uh, then we're going to go and hunt, hunt foxes with uh, golden eagles. So that'd be fun. Proper job. Wow. <laughs> um, I was not expecting that answer, if I'm honest. <laughs> I just thought, you know, uh, um, it, it came to it two years ago. Obviously, we've all been in lockdown two years, two years ago. Unfortunately, completely out of the blue, I lost my dad, um, who w- watched from the side of a lot of the things because he, he sort of came away from field sports a bit um, and um, loved all my trips. And I thought, well, do you know what? Let's just go for it and go a bit wild. So, um, but part of the reason I've done these trips, it's not, you know, the hunting is a, is, is a big part of it. I, I love my game shooting, but, um, I sort of come away from it, a, you know, a little bit. Um, and I actually wanted to spend more time with different, different communities and different cultures of hunting because we're all of the same family and all of the same, um, you know, mindset. We just do things differently. And it, I think it's fascinating to, to see how people do things differently and also to try a lot of the local homebrew. <laughs> that's the real way of doing it. That's, that's an unbelievable. I mean, just, just to have that many trips planned in. I mean, you say you're a PR and brand consultant. There's literally no time to do that, is there? I, I, I've got a phone. I mean, I, the first time I did a Nor- I was in Norway um, in September last year. Um, I'd come away from a work trip um, five days for an event with Paratsi, straight on the plane to Norway. We went out into the, into the mountains. We, we were actually going to go and shoot some... Um, Capacali as well, but um, we were a little bit more elusive than we thought. But whilst we're out there, um, I had zero signal at all. We get on the very top of this mountain whilst we're, we're, we're glassing for um, this particular moose that we're looking at, and a message pings in, a voicemail, and then the signal dies again. And it was my uh, doctor from back home. Can you give me a call? We need to speak to you. Oh, God. <laughs> Crikey. <laughs> I think I'm 15 miles from the nearest track where we get signal at this point because we have to get, get back. I'm in panic mode thinking, what the hell's going on? What's the matter? Anyway, we, we didn't get into that particular moose. We got back. We drove another eight miles to get to some phone signal. I phoned them because we the time difference, I was just in time. And he goes, oh, nothing. I'm just, just checking everything was okay. Um, you know, I followed because I had an operation. I went, are you absolutely, we know each other. And I went, are you for real? you know and then explain where i was and he just burst out laughing so <laughs> so phone signal as a pr and brand consultant is imperative but also when you've just had an operation as well yeah exactly so so of these trips then which is the one that's sort of jumping out to you i mean obviously you just mentioned that mongolia one which sounds like it's not the not sort of thing you've done before no, no but no. but aside from that which, which is the one that's jumping out at you everybody said saddle so i'm dreading it <laughs> oh really yeah <laughs> Apparently, they're not the nicest of um, saddles. They're just wooden planks. <laughs> Ouch. You're like we haven't ridden a bike for ages and you go on a big, long bike ride and then pay for it for the next few days. <laughs> Ulta in Norway will be special for the salmon um, because from what I'm t- well, from what all my seriously expert fishermen friends are saying, it's, it's a one true place. You've got the chance of catching a 50-pound salmon. And also, it's special. It's, it's, it's a beautiful spot. Yeah, I mean, the photos of those fish are just unbelievable but again i'm more excited because i'm already talking to my um my guide who's, who's going to be with me and we're already planning you know what we're going to do and and he's he's sharing photos uh, photos with me of you know he's out hunting there at the moment and i just love that and that's a special thing for me when you're building that relationship and that's the perk of social media um the big one will be the ibex in kyrgyzstan i think this year anyway because um we're looking into it now and they're saying that they're Planning on ending it in two thousand in twenty at the end of this year, so twenty twenty three onwards, it's going to be it's going to be banned. Um, Why? Well, there was there's there was a, a very narrow vote, I believe, about five years ago, where they said, well, we'll allow it for a period, and then after this period, they're having a cooling off few years. But we but speaking to some of the outfitters and um, and agents, they're thinking that they're not going to bring it back, which will be desperately sad. so just literally simply an outright ban not even in the name of science like they would to monitor well changes and stuff i think i don't know 
I mean, I'm still new to new to this. Yeah. But the, I think I think there's some confusion about it. But we've seen I've seen some documents and some emails that have been sent around, uh, and that's what people are saying. Um, which will, if it doesn't come back, it'll be desperately sad for for the economy and for the and for the population. Of, I was going to say because it's it's pretty it's a pretty popular place and thing to do, isn't it? As as far as hunting goes. Yeah, it's massively popular with um, the uh, the American market as well as, as well, but. I mean, I can't imagine Kyrgyzstan's getting tons of tourism. No, no. I, I, was, told, I, was, I was told, actually. I, I saw um, David from Field Sports the other day at the, uh, the stalking show, and he, he said to me, he said, you've got to have the fermented mare's milk. I went, <laughs> and I, I'm thinking, no, it doesn't sound very nice. He said, it's a rite of passage. So 10 days with, a, with, a, with my friend out in um, a fly camp at some point. So it could be minus 18, minus 20 at night. So, yeah. It's going to be a hell of an experience. I always think, though, when somebody tells you that something's a local speciality or it's a rite of passage, that is serious red flag time. <laughs> the, re- the reason it's become it's a local speciality is because nobody outside of that locality would be insane <laughs> enough to actually consume it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Lo- local just means unadopted, like that hasn't, <laughs> hasn't travelled. Exactly. I'll quite happily adopt the uh, badge of the, the village of idiot for that trip anyway. <laughs> no way. <laughs> but I think what, what you say about um, experiencing those local cultures and local hunting cultures and everywhere being a family, or, you know, we're all connected by what we do. I think that's a really, really powerful point. I think there'd be an amazing book to be written by somebody looking at the different communities and hunting cultures around the world and how they what they've got in common, how they vary from one another. I think it'd be an absolutely fascinating. Maybe you're the person to do it, Nathan. Who know? Who knows? It is, it is, it is, I might freeze. I might freeze to death. Yeah. I mean, apparently, Greenland's going to be minus forty-five. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> minus forty. I mean, I've done some time on the east coast of Canada in that sort of temperature, and my God, you've well, got to be kitted I'm out. Inebriated. That'd be that'd be the way to do it. No, that's such a bad idea. Don't do that. If you're honestly, I I remember seeing a, a thermometer at the top of this mountain. Uh, it was in a it was in a ski resort on the east coast, uh, and with the wind chill, because obviously this thermometer was out exposed in the direction of the wind, it just said minus ninety nine. It had maxed out, and it was minus fifty seven apparently without the wind chill and. You, you could like spit on the ground and your spit would bounce because it had frozen by the time it hit the ground. That's the sort of thing I love. I can't do heat. I'm dreadful with heat, you know. Um, so I, I prefer, you know, the, the, the cooler climbs, let's, let's just say. But, but yeah, I mean, going back, going back to the point, I think, I think to, to meet different people whose livelihoods and whose way of life is, is a, based around hunting and shooting and anything, anything to do with with that those traditional roots is it will be will be amazing and it's that for me i'm more i'm more interested if i i I always have a rule if i go somewhere and i don't shoot something or if i don't succeed in it but i've had an amazing time that's more important to me because you know it's an experience it reminds me of the quote that's in the game card this week george uh which is the hunter does not hunt in order to kill on the contrary he kills in order to have hunted Yes. which I love. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so, so I was about to ask you about, you know, can you do a bit of a sales pitch? Because because most of most people listening to this episode will probably not really shoot abroad. We've done some research on it in the past. And because we're kind of blessed with so much here, you don't often don't really need to travel. I mean, I and, haven't. No, I haven't really either. So just saying, yeah, you want to go abroad because it's going to be like minus 40 is probably not the best way to get them in. So if, if it was a sales pitch and you were going to say to someone now, you know, to put it right, you know, get a, at least get one trip in this year. What, what would you say? How would you go about convincing someone to do that? I think looking back on two years of being stuck in lockdown, being stuck in an office, not seeing family, friends and whatever, it changed my perception on uh, on our um uh, industry and our sport um because we couldn't do the big group things necessarily that um that we're so akin to so it made me have to think outside the box as to what i wanted to do and when we could travel i sort of i've never really been one for traveling and I actually did a lot this year and it was very freeing it was quite liberating from being quite boxed in to being able to go and do something it was amazing and actually to get to that sense of adventure that you get wherever, wherever you're going. I mean, I've, I've got a client I look after in Spain. He's got an amazing partridge shoot. So if you're not after 
um, go and shooting, um, you know, bigger game or something like that, or you just want to go abroad and shoot, um, you know, classic game day. You know, it's just interesting to see a different perspective. I mean, how they run the, Sp- the Spanish partridge shoots are incredible. And actually, the pricing in relation to our own shooting this year and, and going forward is actually going to be really, really competitive. So I, I'd say to people, ask yourself a question. Do you, are you quite happy with being being on your you know your regular shoot, going to your regular location or being familiar with a shoot that you've shot at every single year? Or would you like to spice it up a little bit? And the chances are most people would like to be, would be open-minded enough to spice it up. And, you know, you go to Spain and you shoot and you have a little tapas for it instead of 11s or, um, you know, and you can have a little break, breaks in the afternoon and um, how they do things and, and see how they dr- how they bring drives in and how the, how the pickers up work. It's, it, whilst the, the concept is very similar and very much the same, they all have the little quirks and it's nice to pick up on that. I mean, the, the growth of Guns on Pegs would absolutely suggest that you're right because clearly people weren't just happy with what they were always doing. Otherwise, our website wouldn't really have a place. So we know that you're knocking on an open door here to a point. But I think there's always just this, there's there's often some dodgy stories of people's experiences abroad. I think that that, that kind of it ruins it for many, doesn't it? Because one story goes a long way and, and someone will go, I had a dodgy time shooting pheasants in the Czech Republic. And the next time someone mentions Czech Republic and pheasants, they're like, no, not for me. It doesn't matter. In, and it's it, it kind of just re- takes it back a number of years. So, yeah, I think, it, I suppose you're, we're looking to sort of ease people's concerns here. You know, how do you go about it? What's your first sort of steps? I mean, I think the best way of doing it is, Absolutely, contact an agent. But make sure you go to an agent that is that is very familiar with doing with doing um, trips abroad. And on the first couple of times that you do it, I, I always say it's absolutely better to, um, to to spend the money and, and, and pay a premium for it, so that you know and, and have peace of mind with that, and pay for their knowledge of doing it. Because actually, what, what people don't realise is that they're actually missing out on a, on a whole world of, of, of shooting out there. Or contact an agent, there's, there's plenty out there, speak to them, ask their opinion on it, probe them for questions, um, ask them for, for pictures, videos, and even where possible, speak to clients, ask them to, if, they can, if you can speak to some of their clients. I'm sure if they're confident in, their, in what they do, then I'm happy to do so. I've, I've definitely got a tip here from, I haven't done it, uh, so being honest about that, but from sitting my side of the fence from, from Guns on Pegs, the times I've heard it go wrong, it's because someone has gone with an agent who actually hasn't done that trip before. They've done all the research, they've spoken to the people, they think they know everything, but they get there and it's like, oh, we're staying there, are we? And it looks, you know, you can take a photo from a good angle. You can't see what's around it necessarily. And I think, therefore, the question to ask of the agent is literally experience. You know, how many t- trips have you done to this exact place with this exact person? With, you know, and, and really just ask honest questions, which pe- people often are afraid of asking, but you shouldn't. I always say to people, it's your money that you're spending. You have every right to ask the questions you want and to get the answers that you need before you book it, because that's the whole exchange, the business exchange. But there's so many opportunities out there. And I think people should just you know, grab the bull by the horns and um, and go for it. Go to Kyrgyzstan. <laughs> Jump on a plane. <laughs> Let's just go. Yeah, I mean, um, so one of the things that's always interested me is, you know, you look at the prices of some of these things and you think, crikey, that does, it's, it's a big lump of money sometimes. What do, you, what do you think the minimum is that you could get, uh, you know, a decent, say, shooting weekend for in europe what have you got an, an idea about what that kind of number would be it, it depends again how long's a piece of string yeah bit of a vague question for me personally that i know i've got i've got friends and i've got some clients that shoot um and they want to shoot trophies and they want to do that and, and which isn't for me it's not my cup of tea and they want to spend big money doing it and that's not how i do things yeah I agree, but you're also going to be paying through the nose for it so if you if you if you're wanting to go sort of first time going out and trying to shoot trophies is just not you wouldn't be doing that it's ludicrous and, and as i say it's never it's never interested me no the the the, 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 the experience learning from the guide is far more important to me and actually and even even if it's a, a little game day you know you can do some smaller um driven days in spain now for 
very much the same price, if not a little bit cheaper than you would do for for, for birds over here. I mean, I know price per bird, especially this year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I know estates I've spoke to, and they're thirty two euros a bird. Really? Gosh. Yeah. So, so, so to rephrase George's question slightly, then to if you had to pick one trip this year and make it the best bang for your buck, quite literally, w- w- which w- which one would it be, or what would it be? Alter for salmon fishing for me for me personally because it's it's a special. But if you're talking shooting, then um, the moose in Norway for the simple reason that I'm going back with friends, and um, it's not a trophy hunt. It's it's a management hunt that I've booked on to do, um, and you get all the experience. Um, it's it's not silly money at all, and it's just beautiful. You know, it's just a beautiful place. How many of you going? Um, I just got, well, it's just me. I just fly out there and hunt with my two two friends. Oh, they're already out there? They're already out there. And that'll probably be the price of a, a, a reasonably nice pheasant day. But it's something else that I can sit and talk to people about. Yeah, yeah. You know, I wanted to cry after, you know, like, like you just, you, you're absolutely broken after you've done it and you, you know, you feel dressed the, uh, the moose. And then you rucksack it off and carry it back. And my little spindly legs just don't want to, don't want to work. <laughs> I was hiking. But, you know, you get back and you just go, that was absolutely fucking incredible. Excuse my French. It's got it's got a lot more stories than just one extra pheasant day in your diary, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It does. And that doesn't, that for me, don't get me wrong. I love a pheasant day because I love working the dog. I love being there. And I, I, I love shouting down the line when a friend misses a bird or something like that. But my mindset has changed from shooting larger days, let's just say, to forget the shooting side. You know, it, you know, do a few smaller days a season as opposed to one or two big days. And just have that have that banter with your friends. That's that's more about it. So so I think the the Norway example for me to make that absolutely perfect, I'd want to go out with a few mates, like a a, a small group of us, like half a line, as it were, yeah. uh, that sort of number, and then be able to sort of set off maybe in different directions or in pairs after moose or something, but be able to come back and sort of relive to the day's experiences over dinner in the evening in front of the fire, that sort of thing. For me that element is almost as important as the being able to go out there and do it in the first place, because it's about sharing that opportunity with your mates and then having that conversation. I think if I was sort of going on my own to the airport and then meeting some people out there, I just, just wouldn't do it. I would, I mean, you, maybe if you were really good mates, that's fine, but I think that's the key bit. No, I, I agree. I mean, I wasn't in a, I just happened to find myself where I ended up there on my own and I thought, bugger it let's just let's just go for it and and that's how you know you meet you know you actually make make new make new friends you're not reliant for me in this instance i thought oh, i can't just be reliant on being with a being with a friend but i fully agree with you it's amazing to go and then you've got to go with friends and then you come back and six months down the line you're in the pub and you go bloody hell George just popped into my head do you remember that you know um yeah the social side is just so massive for me yeah, I completely agree. Nathan, have you done much shotgun shooting in, in Europe? You mentioned Spain. Have you done? Have you been anywhere else? Um, I've not done a huge amount. Out, no, um, I did. Funny enough, I did shoot. I, I did do some last year. Um, I was with a German team, and it was the most incredible post shoot party I have ever been to. <laughs> We're in Kustad in the in the north of Germany. Um, I've never seen, let alone drank, so much schnapps in my life. Um, I was told uh, not to mix schnapps uh, and beer, which I did. But it was that was um, that was post post hunting, obviously. But um, we'd been out, and it was a huge line. And I'd never, I, and I was like, there must have been fifty guns, you know, broke up over this huge acreage, and the only and the only shoot it once or twice a year. The people there were absolutely incredible. They were, I couldn't. I thought I could speak German. I really can't. So, <laughs> um, yeah, and that's where, for me, shooting and hunting become a language in itself because you can point at things and immediately everybody knows what you're talking about. Yeah. It was just, that was shot, that was shot with shooting. That was sort of walked up for hare and uh, woodcock and, um, and pheasants. And there is something really quite hilarious but also really concerning at the same time when you've got a line of you and 49 germans 
all walking through this thick brush and one minute they're going from shooting woodcock and pheasants and you hear the cut of the call for um wild boar and you just hear everyone open the, their guns and change to solid slugs. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope to God somebody hasn't. Then, it, then nothing comes, and then you think, I hope to God somebody hasn't left a slug in there when they're shooting um, anything else. You know, but it was just that was a real experience, and everybody gathered, and we all, you know, you know, and the, the light the fires, and the ceremony at the end is is beautiful because it's so respectful to the game. Um, and it's a shame we don't quite do that over here in the same way. Uh, and then the party after was just uh, insane. Of which, talking of fines, I got fined four bottles of schnapps. For shooting a woodcock with a slug? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, no, mine, mine was for not bowing my head in respect at the game because I was so fascinated. I was I was too busy taking photographs. Oh, right, yeah. And, um, I can't remember the other one. And then I donated to for, to the hunt to, to say thank you. And just wonderful memories of things like that. But yeah, that was my that was the last time I shot gun shot in Germany. Did you find that your German got better or worse with the quantity of schnapps consumed? Um, I felt it got in incredibly it, it, it improved incredibly you know it was you know i was fluent by the end of it um i think the i think people would would say something to the contrary but yeah no well i did i studied languages at university and i'm pretty convinced that if everybody was allowed to have two pints before every french lesson at school everyone would be a lot better at foreign languages it just helps relax people exactly you, know, you stop caring whether you're making mistakes and just roll with it I, yeah <laughs> flashbacks now to my French um, exam, um, French and German, where I think, um, what was it? They asked me, what what did I do for my last birthday? And I couldn't think of anything. So I said, um, I, I had fruitcake for my birthday, which... <laughs> But actually, what I actually said was, for my last birthday, I was a fruitcake. <laughs> so, yeah, probably my my German didn't improve over the course of the night. I don't remember very much of it. In my in my uh, Spanish and, and French uh, orals, I always used to try and get pheasant soup in there. I had this like obsession with pheasant soup, and I'd be like, ah, sopa de faisan. <laughs> and the, teach, the, the teacher got, got so pissed off me in class because I dropped pheasant soup, soup into every conversation. I did it in my exam. Come on, be and honest. He, you just memorized the phrase and it was all you had in the in the bank <laughs> I, I honestly there was not much to my french or my spanish but i dropped it out in the in the oral exam and he started laughing during my exam it's, it's just funny language stories everywhere with things like that and i just love it so so right coming back to this year then we, we talked about uh all, all your various your various trips what what are you going to recommend that people do what do you th- what do you think people should should look into first in terms of Going abroad. Going abroad. Um, I think most people. I think. I think the big one will be partridge shooting in Spain. It's always. A, it's always a good one because it's. It's based on the same principles over here that we we've got. An easy transition. Yeah. I always. When I first went over, I was amazed to see how the Spanish shoot their um, their partridge. They shoot them more like grouse, and now I, then I realise why when you shoot with this with, with um, anyone from Spain, they're absolutely deadly on the grouse more. <laughs> <laughs> So partridge shooting, I mean, obviously that's a great suggestion for this year, A, because we've got no partridges and if we do, they're ridiculously expensive. So it sounds like it could be an affordable option. So so would you go, Would you take your own guns or would you borrow guns? I, I mean, if you personally, if you're so precious, take your own guns. It's fairly, fairly straightforward, but we have got the new new permits that have come in now and because we're no longer in the EU. And- but, but an agent can help with that? Agent can help with all of those things. Um, a good agent should be able to will do anyway um but most most um places in most shoots in spain will have their own guns i know the like the estate that i deal with um they have um you know a full full range of guns for people to use um so yeah that's that'd be a first go-to that'd be a first dip in the to, to, uh, you know toe dipping in the water um for people to go abroad i think don't go too big too quickly because it's it gets quite um i mean there's quite a lot of um estates advertising directly on guns on pegs yeah um without the agent and that again you know if you've not done it before that's that's quite a jump but the only time i probably think differently is where the estate advertising is sort of quite a well-known name already yes yeah and i think they're probably they're they're becoming more and more helpful and sort of saying oh you know they'll help you out and and like an agent would to try and get you over there. Well, that's it. The bigger names, the more au fait with the system, the process. They deal with 
with with uh, UK teams all the time, and they become more FA. You know, there are a lot of shoots, just just exactly the same as we've got a lot of shoots here in the UK. There's a lot in Spain as well, many that we'll never even hear of or never even we've never even seen. Exactly the same over here. Um, so if you're going to go with a big name, then that that may be an option. But I always say. Yeah. Don't be too precious over it. Spend a little bit of extra money because at the end of the day, you're still going to be making a saving, certainly this year, uh, and go with an agent. Let them work for you. You relax. It's your holiday. And and the other thing to note about Spain is that, and this is kind of linked to this egg situation uh, and and even less eggs being available uh, than in previous years, is that their, their season for the coming season, so winter twenty. 20- Two twenty three has been extended. So uh, King Juan Carlos has just basically said, you know, up to you. End of March, uh, crack on. Uh, so there's a there's a lot more shooting going to take place in more permits issued. I understand. Yes. In, yeah. in March, so so you don't even have to go during the season. You can wait until this pretty much this time next year. Well, and of course, this time of year, you know, end of March in Spain, the weather is pretty good. Oh yeah, I thought it was perfect when I I was in there. Was that last February? Yeah, lovely, really, really nice. And um, I think it was last February. No, just before lockdown. Just before lockdown, I went. Sorry. Um, so yeah, that's that would be the first one. And then you've got. Oh, I've never been to Czech, um, but um, the pheasants can be quite good there as well. It's it just it, research it, have a look at it, and see what, what you know, see what's out there. But definitely go and do it. There's loads of opportunities. Good man. Right. So, Nathan, we've talked about what you have done. We've talked about what you've got planned. The final segment of every podcast, as you know, is Desert Island Shooting, which is where you get to throw caution to the wind, forget about the cost, forget about the logistics. I mean, it sounds a little bit like you might have done some of those things already. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> but if the the world is your oyster... Where are you going? What are you doing? Who are you taking with you? And you can blend countries together if you like, because money can't sort that out. So you can. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So my real love in terms of game shooting in the UK here, anyway, is grouse. I will. I will shoot a fifteen brace day. I'll shoot. You know, whatever. It doesn't matter. I just love them. So it's got to involve grouse. So I'd have to shoot grouse at Gunnerside. I've not done that yet. Um, I'm hoping to at some point. Grouse at Gunnerside, um, you know, on the twelfth would be would be mega, um, and then, but it's got to be with an A team, okay? You know, because again, the a, I, I want to see the A team shoot because it's not going to be me shooting many grouse, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but that be the, you know, it's got to be the A team on grouse at Gunnerside on the twelfth, um, or even or better still, late October grouse downwind. So who, who's on who's on the A team? I, I'm, I can't say. I don't want to offend this. There's loads of it. There'd be 20 guns on it if it, if it was that way. Because I'm, 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 I'm just I'm missing something out. Yeah, you could just have more butts built, you know, because this is desert island shooting. Do what you like. I've got, I've got to have the Welsh wizard though next to me. In Go, no, is that going? <laughs> um, and um, so yeah, and 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 Tom Payne's got to be on it. So I'll leave it at those two. But Tom and Gerwin have got to be. I've got to be on those days. Um, and then in terms of blending it in, I'd go straight from there. Where was it now? What was, I, I'm, and just do a just do a tour of um, I just do a tour of Europe. <laughs> you know, and that's it. Money's no object. I'll, I'll go do a tour of Europe, drop in, see some friends, hunt with them, and well eat and drink with them and do the occasional bit of hunting but I, I'd, I'd want to make my way through um through, uh, through Europe. over the course of a week and then come back and that's it over the course of a week last hurrah a day here day there you know just private jet here everywhere full-time pilot yeah fair enough yeah be adventurous why not i like the way that you know money's no object whatever i'm still coming back to england having talked about abroad the whole time you know i love i'm really i i'm I'm really odd in that sense because I've been to some wicked places. And I love it, but I still, if I if I go to the, the top of Scotland or the, the far south here, or you know, leave the dog and go go abroad, I still love flying into Manchester Airport. It's home. I've got the luxury I can go pop into Wales. I can go to Yorkshire. I can go to Scotland. Whereas everyone else, all, all the all all the lovely Southerners I shoot with have six hours drive six hour drives north. 
So, so are you so are you saying that Manchester is the perfect home for the enthusiastic sportsman? <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a new claim i've not heard before having said that the times that i've flown into manchester airport uh the patchwork on the moorland that you can see on the plate from the plane coming in you don't get down south when you're flying into any of the london airports and i remember that was just a new experience landing in an airport for me when i was just like oh this is amazing and just like trying to spot work out which more was which oh yeah it's, it's uh, I, I love doing that and that's why when i've got a lot of the, the guys that i shoot with down south and they say oh we've got the best pheasant shoots i go well we've got all the grouse moors so you can keep them <laughs> <laughs> very good that would be that that would be my um last hurrah A very, very worthy one. Right. Well, Nathan, thank you so much for joining us. It's been really interesting, really good fun. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Nathan. No worries. Right. So before we go, as per usual, there's one final reminder that you can get your hands on a pair of the highly desirable Guns on Pegs podcast shooting sock garters by sending us your shooting dilemmas for us to resolve or by getting in touch to let us know where you've been listening or sending us your unpopular opinions or any one of any number of things that we've said will now earn you a set of garters. Just drop us a pod to uh, just drop us a pod. Just drop us an email to pod at gunsonpegs.com. And if we read it out in the next episode or any future episodes, we will send you some garters. We will be back in a couple of weeks with another episode. I think we've actually got that booked in this time, haven't we, Chris? <laughs> Debatable. <laughs> <laughs> but until then, whenever it turns out to be, thanks very much for listening and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>